Matthew 11. Where? Oh. Like I said, Matthew 10. 10 16? Oh. I thought we were in 11. Okay. What is it? 10 16 or 11 16? Hike. Oh! Got egg in his face back there. That's when you were eating popcorn, you didn't write the right thing down, right? <laughs> Sleeping. 11 16. Paragraph mark, yep. But I got a testimony you'd like to give? Anybody want to complain about your wife publicly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, Thursday night prayer meeting, I asked for prayer because I couldn't find a Bible and I was looking for things for six months. And I went home and I wasn't in the house three minutes. And I found Good. I think he walking out and said hello. We're <laughs> good. That's a good answer to prayer. Anybody else got a testimony? Anybody want to quote a Bible verse? Very good. <laughs> Anybody want to quote something for the Quran? <laughs> no. Yeah, when the sun sets and goes down in the mud and bubbles somewhere, that's a while I'm out Yeah. Okay, Matthew eleven sixteen. Not that I'm stalling for anything. I got all this. I got the whole book. I can go. I'm ready to go all the way to act at least in this one. Usually at uh, school, I can remember when the, some of the uh, teachers in chapel class, they wanted to sing longer. I quickly took that as, you don't have much to say today, so <laughs> you're trying to cover up. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness, for your blessings. Lord, I do pray you'd help us understand your word. Pray you'd help us understand that uh, in this day, in this life of this day, and uh, be faithful to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew, um, written by Matthew the Publican, who shows that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah to the Jews, the King of the Jews. Okay, verse 16, we have a paragraph mark. Verse 20, we have another paragraph mark. So we have our context. The Lord speaking, he says, But whereunto I shall, shall I liken this generation, okay, the people that Jesus was preaching at, what are they like? Who are they like? He said it's like unto us children, like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, but and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John neither came or came neither eating or drink nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. A friend of publicans and sinners, and then the Lord says, But wisdom's justified of their children. Okay, so here's what the Lord does. You'll find that the Lord will go to extremes from one end to another. Uh, to try to get man's attention and try to get man to uh, receive a message of some type. John the Baptist came neither eating or drinking. That's one extreme. And if you don't think John the Baptist was a little extreme, <laughs> try eating some locusts for a while. 
the honey was covered over it to cover the taste. That was a bunch of honey. You know, the honey was all around the locust and then, the, then stuffed it in. Okay, so that's one side. And then the Lord's the other side who's eating and drinking. And you have two extremes there. And he says, but you didn't listen to him. You didn't listen to me. Wisdom's justified our children. And you'll see the Lord do that quite often. In the Old Testament, you have a, uh, in essence, a Gentile who becomes the father of the Jews. And in the New Testament, you have a Jew who becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Opposite extreme. You have two books in the Bible where they're named after women. One book is a Gentile woman marrying a Jewish man. The other book is a Jewish woman marrying a Gentile man. Opposite extreme. In the Old Testament, you have a man named Saul who comes from the tribe of Benjamin who starts off good and ends up bad. And you have a guy in the New Testament by the name of Saul who comes from the tribe of Benjamin who starts off bad and ends up good. And the Lord will run these extremes. In the tribulation, the earth will be as close to hell as possible without being in hell, and the vast majority of people will reject Jesus Christ. So now we're going to go an extreme. The millennium is going to be as close to heaven as possible without being in heaven. And at the end of the millennium, the vast majority are going to reject Jesus Christ. What does that show us? It shows that a man's going to do what he wants to do no matter what anybody does. It's a passive generation. He said here, you're like children in a market where one guy played a nice musical note and you just sat and looked at him. And another guy came and going, boo, and you sat and looked at him. Passiveness. In Mark chapter 5, passiveness, a passive society, is a sign of demon possession. Mark 5, that maniac of you there, it says no man could tame him, no man could bind him. Passive society. And a lot of times you can kind of use humor sometimes to try to uh, feel people out. And uh, sometimes uh, people won't have the right response to some things, and that's a passive person. That's somebody that is infested. You can get on the street corners, and you can try to cry your eyes out and win somebody to Christ, and they'll just look at you and laugh at you. And then if you try to tell them about the hellfire and brimstone, they'll just look at you and laugh at you. That's passiveness. And that's what the Lord's saying here. He's saying, we're, God, we are running extremes here, trying to get man's attention. But wisdom's justified over children. Uh, the right person will respond to the truth no matter how that truth is presented. Whether the truth is presented in a loving fashion or in a mean-spirited fashion, somebody who wants the truth will take it from any source. And so that's what the Lord does to us. And there are some folks that you're not going to do anything to please them. There's nothing you can do to make them happy. And uh, if, uh, if you um, uh, try to speak the truth in love, and that don't work, and you try to speak the word like a lion, that don't work, you're dealing with somebody that's going to do what they do no matter what you say. And so the idea is that I, uh, when I witness for the Lord, I usually ask God for the right words at the right time to the right person with the right spirit. And I say, Lord, if you want me to be gentle as a lamb, please help me to be that. But if you want me to be as ferocious as a lion, help me to do that. Because the Lord knows what each individual needs. I don't know. And there are some people, the only way you're going to get their attention is right on top of the head. With the truth. I'm not saying literally. I'm saying with the truth, the word of God, just laying it right out in their face. And that's some folks, that's the only way they get your attention. And in other folks, you gently, in most cases, a gentle thing as far as when you're on people's property, especially one-on-one, uh, -on -one, because the servant of God must not strive with men and dealing with personal um, witnessing. Uh, but yet... Uh, the Lord might give you some strange words to you at certain times to win some people. It says in Proverbs, it says, uh, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and happy is he. 
And so it's, uh, some people have got some weird experiences, and you might be surprised what verses would bring them to salvation. It might be very strange. But when the Spirit of God is guiding you and leading you and giving you the right words at the right time to the person with the right spirit, uh, the, the Spirit's got a plan. He's got a plan. And He knows exactly what every person needs. Now, His plan may be different than ours. Because in Isaiah 55, verse 11, it says, The Word of God will not return to Him void. But yet the Word of God is written for a two, two purposes. James 4, verse 12 says, There's one lawgiver, and the law was written to save and to destroy. Sometimes your witness for Jesus Christ may be for complete destruction of somebody. You never know. But that's God's purpose. So, the only one that knows what everybody needs is the guide of all truth, the Holy Ghost. And so the thing is, is we ask Him for the right words at the right time to the right person with the right spirit. And you might be surprised what comes out of your mouth. <laughs> you might walk away and say, where would that come from? But that's how God works. And we need to be willing to accept that fact. I had a, I had a man recently visit down in Rensselaer after I got done. Uh, he said to me, one of the first things he said, he said, you're very biblical. You're very biblical, but truth needs to be given out in love. Love. It made me think about buying a big teddy bear again and putting it in the back. And he, in essence, told me that his, he tried to win his dad to Christ, and he had witnessed his dad time and time again and used the Scriptures biblically. And nothing worked until his 11-year-old daughter wrote a note of her love for her grandpa. And the one thing that won her dad is... Her love because charity is the greatest of all. And what he did was absolutely accomplish nothing. Boy, he sure gave the Word of God a lot less credit, didn't he? The Word of God sowed the seed in that man's heart. And, of course, his interpretation of love is usually when the way these guys want you to speak the truth in love is like you're talking to adults. Instead of talking to adults, you have adult conversation, you know, adult congregation, but the way you speak the truth in love is like you're talking to a four-year-old child. The Bible says that Jesus loves you. <laughs> now, if you just look at him and say, the Bible says Jesus Christ loves you, and he wants you to get saved, they would interpret that as love. It's a tone of voice. Americans have become to a point where they don't listen to the words, they listen to your tone of voice. And the tone of voice is interpreted as hate. And they don't listen to the words. Why are they like this? Because they've been taught that we came from a monkey evolution and animals respond by sound. And you can say to your little poochie, Good dog, good dog, good dog! And that dog's going to go like this. And then you can say to your little poochie, Oh, you're such a sweet little dog, I'm going to take you out back and put a bullet right in your head. And that dog... Because people listen to the tone of their voice. And so the thing is, is when they hear a prophet of God who's out declaring the words, they don't interpret that as love. They interpret that as uh, cockiness, hatred. Now, I wonder how they would interpret the Lord speaking when he, in, when he starts in verse 20. Oh, they'd be surprised at how the Lord speaks. Then began he to upbraid the cities. Upbraid the city? What's that mean? That means they cut their hair down and they put it in braids, right? 
uh, upbraiding the cities, uh, that is a reproof with severity. That is a bawling out. That's what upbraiding is. It's a chewing out. It's a yelling and a screaming and name calling. Like a Matthew 23, upbraiding the cities. That is, that would be interpreted as those people as, oh, he doesn't have love, but yet that's the Lord Jesus. Now, of course, who is he saying this to? To anybody? No, he's saying it to the three main cities that he did most of his work. And those three cities, verse 20, Then he began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. How do you portray that? In a Mr. Rogers style. That's what they think. Neighbors! Hi, neighbors! How would I say this, neighbors? It's going to get a tad warm, neighbors. Uh, You cannot portray this except as a man on a street corner yelling at a city. Capernaum, which was exalted, which art exalted in heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Okay, I've been to two of those places. Maybe best say it, but I can't remember. Uh, Choraz- Chorazin or Chorazin, I don't know how they pronounce that. Uh, it's like on the side of a hill as you drive up this little hill and you no houses anywhere. You're driving along this road, and all of a sudden, here's a national little park in, uh, in Israel. And all it is is a bunch of rocks stacked up where we think the temple, the synagogue was here, these rocks. And then over here was a house, and over here was this. And it's just rocks. No houses, no buildings, no nothing. And if they want to disprove the Bible, I dare them to try to build a house there. That's all. It, wouldn't it be an easy way to disprove the Bible? Very easy. Jesus Christ said, Woe unto you, Chorazin. He placed a curse upon that place. Capernaum. If you go to Capernaum today, uh, you walk into this. It's, it is also a, not like a national monument or a national park of some type. And you walk in this place and there's a building like here and they've got stuff where they want to sell all the, all the goods. And then you walk in, and then there's, there is a building in here, and the building comes down to a point like this, but it's like on stilts. And in that point, where that point supposedly comes down, was the house of Simon Peter. And of course, guess who owns that building? Uh huh, the Pope. Well, they bring that right down to there. And then when you go to the left, here's supposedly where the synagogue was. And again, it's a bunch of rocks stacked up. And over here, some more things stacked up. But Capernaum, it was cursed by Jesus Christ. Uh, The idea, obviously, for us is whom as much is given, much is required. How is America going to stack up on that? I mean, you could turn on the radio virtually in any place in America and and hear the gospel message of some type. How are Americans going to stack up to this? Now, it's quite interesting, too. It's something that kind of makes you scratch your head. In verse 21, about Tyre and Sidon, and verse 23 in Sodom, in, uh, about Sodom. Here the Lord is saying, if, if these tremendous works that what I did here in Capernaum would have been done in Tyre and Sidon and in Sodom, uh, they wouldn't have been destroyed. They'd have many souls saved. So you would tend to think, why wouldn't God go to those places and win those souls? Like I said, God's got different plans than we got. Okay, and so uh, some of this is kind of beyond, our, I guess, our human comprehension. Uh, but yet, uh, we got to kind of fall in line with what the Lord says. Now, that thing about verse 20, upbraiding. 
that's that's a several years ago I was down in a big metropolis called Brook town of maybe 500 and that's on a good day and I was knocking on some doors and I came across a retired college professor he was uh, late 70s uh, Dan Hoffman was his name I thought fella you need to change your name or change your ways uh, after talking to him for an hour uh, he, I quickly found out that he did not like the Apostle Paul because Paul he called names and Paul also, he thought Paul made fun of vegetarians in, in uh, Romans 14. That's what he thought. So he, he liked the Lord. He thought the Lord was meek and mild, and he, he did not like Paul. And so uh, after an hour, I dealt with the guy about certain things. And uh, after we got done, he said, you know, I've never talked to anybody like you before. And I said, well... I never talked to anybody like you before either, I thought. <laughs> and so I asked him, I said, you don't like Paul because you think he calls names, right? He said, yeah. I said, do you ever read Matthew 23? No. I said, why don't you read that sometimes? About what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And then a month later, we went back, I guess, for just sheer entertainment, went back to the same guy, go to a hair tip two times. Talked to him again, and this time he got big on the nonviolent thing. Oh, I believe in nonviolence, 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 nonviolence. So finally I got kind of sick of it, and I said to him, I said, what would you do if somebody broke in your house and was going to kill your wife? And then he goes, oh, I, I think there is a time for violence then. <laughs> and then he, of course, did not believe the Lord Jesus Christ was God. And so... I set them up. I mean, college professors, I, you really, you have to be, go through formal education to be that dumb sometimes. But uh, I just said to him, I said, okay, if the Lord is not God, uh, he would never allow anyone ever to say that he was God, right? Well, of course not. I flipped to John chapter 20, verse 28, where Thomas looked at Jesus and said, my Lord and my God, and smiled. And I said, what do you think of that? Well, I've never talked to anybody like you before. <laughs> well, you get to wonder about folks like that, and you see the purpose of our conversation, I would say, would be for his destruction. He had a choice of seeing clearly what the Bible says. And the Lord will do that. Doesn't a surgeon take a knife and cut on somebody's body? The initial cut is not helpful, but it's intended to be helpful, right? And that's what the scriptures will do. The Bible is a shocking book. And all of us, if we'd be honest, when we were learn some things in the Bible, all of us probably would say, oh, I never saw that before. Couldn't believe that. But we had to accept these things. Now, what makes us accept it is verse 25. Paragraph mark again, verse 25, it says, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babies. Okay, the cross-reference on that is very similar. Luke chapter uh, 12, I think. Luke 12, 11... thinking off the top of my head. Luke 10. Getting close. Backing up. Luke 10, 21. Luke 10, 21. Okay, now this one says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit. Now that is the only record of the Lord rejoicing. Obviously I know he rejoiced more than this, but as far as the only record of his rejoicing is here, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, or babies, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now, what's he saying? The Lord was happy that God 
hid some information, some truth from a group that they thought they were wise and prudent. This group thought they were wise and prudent, and the Lord thought it was the Lord thought it was wonderful that these people did not get these simple truths. In other words, the Lord thought the Lord enjoyed when a worldly wise person who's got all the PhDs could not understand a simple truth of the Bible. The Lord thought it was funny when a worldly wise person could not understand simple things in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians, the Lord puts it this way. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them, and then so forth. Okay, if you go down to uh, PU, Purdue University, and, and get out there and preach, most of those college kids would say, what a fool, what a fool, what a fool. Oh, they're ever learning and never able to come knowledge truth. But yet, that is God's method of bringing the gospel. That's his method. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, okay, now again, we're not against getting an education, not against that at all. I do believe you should educate yourself as much as possible, but don't, don't think just because it's a formal education means it's official. Uh, education, virtually all education is self-education, whether you call it formal, public, private, home, or just by yourself reading information and educating yourself. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. If somebody has, say, all the degrees on the wall, wall and everything, I gadgeted from this place and this place and this place, and I've been meticulated through all these places. Okay, so here's the Bible command. It says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. That is a Bible command. Let's say an example. Let's say somebody has graduated from high school and they wanted to be an English teacher. So they went to college for four years, English major. They even got a master's degree in English major. Let's say they got saved. As a Bible command, with that vast education of learning the English language, they should use ain't to try to witness to people or talk as a Christian. Why? Because that's what people use. Should use straight and plain terminology as like we Hoosiers, we always get the we was and the we were always mixed up. And they should do that. And use double negatives. Just talk straight and plain with people because that's the way we are. That's the way we understand things. Street talk. And I'm not saying slang in particular and not being purposely slang, but yet... Uh, in 2 Corinthians 3.12, it says, Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. When I witness to somebody, I don't tell them, I would like to share with you the doctrine of soteriology so that I can exalt you and exhort you so that you might come to fuller knowledge of the Lord and Savior. No, very straight and plain. When we, when we give the gospel story out in an intellectual fashion, we ruin the gospel story. You can go to a Methodist church, Presbyterian, Lutheran church. You can probably even go to a Catholic church. And as a Christian, you can listen very intently and closely. And you can pick up the gospel story presented in there. You'll hear them say, Christ died for our sins. You'll hear things like this. But you see, they give it in an intellectual fashion where in 1 Corinthians 1.17 says that when the gospel is given by the wisdom of words, it makes the gospel of none effect. Several years ago when my grandfather Hoffman died, my uncle, Dutch Reformed, Domini, minister, had the service. Uh, as I'm listening, I was very surprised that he did mention the plan of salvation. He did mention it. And uh, he gave a pretty decent warning about it. 
But yet, even at that, it was mentioned to the point where saved people could pick up on it. Lost people would just buzz right over their head. Why? Because it wasn't straight and plain. If our gospel is so good, we should give it so a four-year-old could understand it. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 11.6, he said, Though rude in speech, not in knowledge. Paul had the education. He was trained by Gamaliel, one of the best teachers of the day. Yet, Paul talked so that the average man could understand him. When I had the truck stop ministry down there in uh, Exit 201, uh, if I had a dollar for every time I heard a trucker say this, I'd, I'd have quite a, few mo- quite a bit of money in my pocket. But I'd heard man after man say to me, I learn more Bible listening to you in 30 to 45 minutes than I have in my entire life. And these guys were guys that did attend church once in a while, not all of them, but some of them. And the reason why that was true wasn't because of me, it's because I just talked very plain so that they could understand it. Now, if a person can talk with the big words, we ought to be able to use the world of words. You know, it take, I believe it takes more wisdom, it takes more thinking, it takes more study to make something complex simple than it is to make something simple complex. I believe it takes more study to do that. You see, a lot of times a teacher thinks that they are, just, they, they are to, imp, they are to uh, impress you with their knowledge. That is not the purpose of a teacher. A teacher is not to impress with knowledge. A teacher or preacher is to impart knowledge. They impart the knowledge so that the listener, when they get to that age of my age, say these kids, when they get to my age, they should know more Bible than I do at my age. They should know more Bible at 45 than I do right now. Why? Hopefully they would add to what I gave them. But when somebody's trying to impress, there's a, a farmer... Uh, came down to Richler Church. His pastor uh, liked to use the big flowing words. After he heard me preach, he walked out and he said, well, at least I don't have to have a dictionary to understand him. Now, my motto is never use a big word when a small word will do. But to be honest with you, I don't think I can use the big words. Smiles, that's the largest word I can give you. It's over a mile long. It's got S on each end. Okay, so that's a long one. Uh, why, why, do we, do, why do I speak like this? Because the Bible gives me such joy. I want everybody to have that joy. And the only way I can portray that joy is to just use the language I understand. Very simple, very plain. So that when you walk out the door, you know what I was trying to get across. Hopefully that's the Spirit of God enforcing it. So the Lord backs this up. What kind of people like to hear Jesus Christ preach? Mark 11.35, it said the com- 12.35, the common people heard him gladly. Now, if the common people heard him gladly, he had to be talking in the common language. And of course, that's where our common sayings come up. That's what I love about the common sayings. As we go through our Bible, we pick up these common sayings. To me, that makes this book right here just come alive. And, you know, when I preach some places, I usually mention those common sayings. And I've had people tell me time and time again, I never saw that like that before. That makes that Bible so real. And I said, yes, it does, doesn't it? And it just makes the words of this Bible jump off the page. But you see, the Lord Jesus, in Matthew eleven twenty five. He rejoiced because God hid these things from the worldly wise people. You go to the state schools, you go to the Christian schools of higher learning. And a lot of times, to be quite honest with you, probably the kids who have applied themselves here, who are in 7th and 8th grade, probably know more Bible than those folks do. So the thing is, is the Lord wants us to remain humble, humble ourselves, remain in a childlike faith, 
You see, we are to grow up and mature in understanding, but in malice be children. But we need to retain the childlike faith of children. Be followers of God as dear children. And so God promised his words were going to be preserved forever. So as a child, I'm just thinking, okay, I guess he's done that. I wonder where they are. I've got to get my hands up, and i got my hands on them. And then he says, verse 26, Matthew 11, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Then he said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he that... And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Okay, Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty, very popular verses. We've probably all heard messages preached on the, of these. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A uh, typical thing. Uh, we when we think of rest, we mean we think vacation. And, of course, I think it was last year about this time I preached on take a vacation. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in taking a vacation, getting away. And I encourage you, if the Lord gives you the opportunity to leave this area and go someplace and go camping, go as a family, or if you want to go with friends, do it. Just do it. Just get away. The Lord told His disciples, if you don't come apart... The idea is, if you don't come apart, you'll come apart. And the Lord told His disciples, He said, come apart and rest a while. And during these vacations, you know, ask the Lord to guide you what church to go to. And it's a good education. Okay, but the Lord says now here in verse 28, uh, when He says, I'll give you rest... Uh, the Lord is not saying uh, rest as in you get to sleep and saw logs and all that stuff. Uh, his rest is he's going to dump more work on us. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Doesn't sound like rest to me. The Lord said, I'm going to give you rest. But, oh, by the way, while you're resting, take this yoke. <laughs> i got a business for you. Take this yoke upon you, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the key words are in there in verse 29, three words, learn of me. Learn of me. Like Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, and Martha was busy cumbering about, doing much service, Martha complained and said, why don't you make my sister help me? And the Lord said, Martha, Martha, you, you're frustrated, I could tell. I could see that you're frustrated in your service. You're careful and troubled about many things. But Mary, oh, Mary here, she's chosen a good part. And what she's chosen will not be taken away from her. Implying that what Martha chose could be lost. What was Mary doing? Listening to Jesus Christ. Sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and listening to Him, does that mean Mary never did anything for Jesus Christ? Uh, well, her service is recorded three times in Matthew, Mark, and John. And that service was so highly honored by Jesus Christ that the gospel that's going to be preached uh, in the tribulation, they're going to have to give a memorial to Mary's service. That's how precise her service was. Learning of me. Now, here's the thought process on this, is the more you learn of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you fall in love with him, the more you fall in love with him when he asks you to do something you don't even consider it as work because you love him so much. My yoke is easy. If you do something for someone you love, it's not a burden. If you do the same exercise for somebody that you don't really care about, it becomes a drastic burden. And to me, the best illustration I can give to illustrate this is uh, jogging or running. Personally, I hate jogging. I hate running. I respect people highly who are like marathoners or do run five, six miles a day. Me, personally, I've been on a few occasions where I, you know, a screw came loose and I thought that I need to run for a while. And I think I made it three days after three days and said, that's enough of that. So I don't like running. I don't like jogging. 
Uh, even to the point where I would get my point when I would do my running or my jogging, I'd sprint from one pole to the next, and the next one I'd jog, and the next one I'd sprint, and after the next one I said, forget this, I'm going to jog the rest of the way. But I sure do like basketball. As a Hoosier, basketball is just a wonderful thing to take a dumb little orange ball and throw it in a dumb little orange ring 10 feet off the ground, and I'll run my full head off on that without even thinking about it. And uh, in our men's league, most of the guys are playing one game. I'll play two every time, sometimes three, and a couple times four straight. Running, 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 running everywhere. And loving the game. But I hate jogging. Why? It's the love of the sport. And the same goes with Christianity. To love the Lord Jesus Christ and to fall in love with Him. The way you fall in love with Him is you love the Word of God. And you spend time in the Word of God. And when you love the Lord Jesus Christ as He is, when He asks you to do something, you say, Do you want me to do something? Yeah, I do. Oh, what do you want me to do? I want you to do this. Gladly. No problem. And the Lord says, oh, hey, by the way, uh, you've been doing this, and I'd rather you not do that. Oh, really? What's that? This right here. Oh, you don't want me to do that anymore? No problem. But see, the average Christian don't have that. They'll say when you preach against uh, some sin or their vice, say, legalist. No, it's a negative. You want me to give that up? It's like uh, several years ago, Brother Roloff. Uh, Brother Roloff, he's a health nut. He preached against coffee and tea and pop and all this stuff. Preached against the television. And uh, I guess one time he and Ruckman was preaching in a place, and Ruckman was preaching against all these other things, new versions, you know, contemporary music, all this stuff. And after a week, one lady walked up to either one of them, I forgot who, which, and said, Brother Roloff took this away from us, this away from this way. You took this, this, this one. What do we got left? And he said, well, I suppose you got the Lord. But isn't it amazing if you go to some churches and if you preach on their hot tub subject, whatever it is, some little fundamentalist thing or whatever, they'll be amen and you like crazy. And then you preach a message on the Lord Jesus Christ and it'll be as quiet as a funeral. Shouldn't we be loving the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. And see, that's why the Lord says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of me. Learn of Jesus Christ. And you learn of Him, you fall in love with Him, and you'll be glad to do some things for Him. Makes the yoke easy, makes the burden light. Okay, that's the end of chapter 11. We'll stop there. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd help us to uh, know more and more about you, your character, your personality, your likes, your dislikes. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord and then serve the Lord with gladness. And Lord, the way we serve you is gladness is we fall in love with you and your word. And when you direct certain things, we're glad to do it. We, we, we are honored that you would ask us to do something. We feel honored by that. An omnipotent, almighty God asking a puny little human to do something and to work together with them. Oh, what an honor, what a blessing. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to take advantage of the great blessings you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.